verse uh, 5, and I come down to verse 11. Okay, no, Christian. Yes. Not a killer Christian. 
Uh, you read there in one place, it says, For this cause many Christians, many among you are sickly, and many uh, are weak, and some sleep. They're dead. Why? Because we can judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. For we are judged with chasing the Lord. Quick. In other words, if you're God's child, and you do wrong, you get a hook. And he should be forgot by that exhortation. But then he goes on and says, For whom the Lord loveth be chased. And this is the scripture that every song has never seen this. Now, that thing there says that uh, our God has chased us and scripture us because he loves us. Huh. Like I heard a Christian say one time, he said, I wish he could love me so much. <laughs> and but then the verse doesn't say he, that he's going to scourge you because you're no good yourself. And doesn't say he's going to whip you because uh, you live after the flesh. The verse says, if you look at it there, it says, he scourges every son. Right? Well, that means the good one is one of the bad ones. You say, well, if I get equipped for something I haven't done wrong, what's that? That's kind of on credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's in case you do something wrong. <laughs> and uh, this brings up the greatest problem in the Bible, and the Bible is the greatest problem on earth. The greatest problem on earth has always been, and nobody ever takes time to try to even think about it, but the greatest problem has not even been uh, sin or death. You can figure them out because you're in them. But the greatest problem on this earth has been, why do the righteous suffer? The first book in your Bible was written was not the book of Genesis, it was Job. The book of Job was written in 1800 B.C., about 300 years before Moses was born. And Moses writes, and Moses says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, the first left form void, dark upon the face of the so forth and so on. He writes that thing in 1500 B.C. And long before that, the book of Job took place in 1800 B.C. So the oldest book in the Bible is not Genesis. Now, Genesis records the things that happened in the first, the oldest. But the first written book that ever shown this is the book of Job. And the book of Job, the theme of that book is why the life is hard. You know what the Lord said about uh, to the devil about uh, Job? He said, uh, you moved me to destroy him without a cause. What's that? That's God confessing he's doing wrong. Yes. He said, I have no cause for doing the treat Job like I'm treating him, and you're causing me to do it. When I get a thing on the you know what that is. It's God testing Job. And there's a contest going on. And that's the problem that takes place in the unseen world. And if you don't believe in Satan, don't believe in God, you never figure it out. Brethren, the things that are going to happen to this earth, I don't care how wise you are, you are not going to be able to figure it out. This precious stuff happens to you. And that's what that thing is about. Now, we all know why um, wicked people suffer. Anybody knows that. When Paul got out there and uh, got out of that shipwreck out there, uh, he caught it, he was putting off. Uh, uh, sticks on a fire, and a viper came out of there and did it, a deadly serpent. And they all watched him to fall down dead. And he didn't fall down and die. And you know, when, when, when that serpent bit him, that what was pagan heathen on that island said? They said, oh, come on. Even this little fellow escaped the sea, the, the caught up with him, boy. I mean, it was venues, so he must be a murderer. But they caught up with him. See, any unsaved man knows why bad people suffer. You take out in the heart of the jungle out there, they're not supposed to know nothing about the Bible, don't have any Ten Commandments. When a man steals, they cut off his left hand. And they steal the second time, they cut off his right hand. And they steal the third time, and they kill him. Why? Right. What's wrong with stealing? You say, anybody knows what's wrong with stealing? Then you should have said a mouthful, is it? Did you say that? You're saying no matter what condition people are in, without a Bible, without God, they still know right and wrong. And when somebody does wrong, he pays for it. So when a person gets sick, first thing they think is, well, now what do you do wrong? You think, oh, Joe, he's a man of ash, he's got health and diets, and maybe a couple of other African communities, they got some good age. That's simple, that's gonorrhea, that's age, that's Ebola, that's, elephant, that's leprosy. You know, then you got you get you flopping. And old Joe was sitting on the ash heap and he straightened himself a piece of broken pottery. And his wife was cussing him out and saying he cursed God and died. And his servants have turned against him and his friends have turned against him. And he's got four over the top of his head at the bottom of his feet. He just had to bury ten children in one day. And you never have to do that. Bury ten children in one day. And the Bible says, when that happened to Job, Job said uh, he didn't charge God foolishly. He said, uh, he said, the Lord gave, the Lord taken away, the blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not see him, but God, God foolishly. And his wife came to him and said, curse God and die. How could you 
may be right going through this. Obviously, you look like the devil. This will happen. See? 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 That's how we are. Come on, folks, maybe. Are you that way? I'm just going to go to the What did he do wrong? Well, maybe he did something wrong. Maybe he didn't. Now, I'm going to show you tonight why good and righteous people who love God and believe the book and pray and pay the bills and love the Lord suffer. And uh, you need to know that because uh, that problem is such a terrible problem. It's what creates atheists. I, you can create atheists easy just use your head. I'm going to live here. How many folks believe God is all powerful? Let me see your hands. All right, how many folks believe God is love? Let me see your hands. And why is it going to be all powerful? You say, what? What goes on? Well, the dead baby is going to be flushed down the toilet, left in the garbage can, and back coming home dead and on fire, please. You could pass the case, and gone, and they gone, and your mother, a good godly woman, dies of cancer before you're 15 years old. What is that? If God love, you call that love? I say you make an atheist. An atheist said, well, if he's love, he, he stopped this thing. Unless he couldn't stop it. In which case, he wouldn't be all powerful. So he just throws God out of the window. That's the way you do your head, baby. You're real smart. That's how you make atheists. Like that. But there's always a reason for these things. Then you just can't figure them mm -hmm. out. Now, our text here is uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, the verse uh, 11. And if you read that whole thing, that means something like this. It says, You have forgotten the exhortation that speaks unto you as of the children, saying, My son, despise not thou the faith of the Lord, nor and I'll for him to them. You know, there's two responses there. Number one, don't faint and don't despise. Now, what does that mean? That means when the kid falls out of the car and gets killed, or you lose your uh, house, or you got to cut off the gas and water, or you get fired from the job and you can't pay your bills, and God laughs you and whipping you, don't do two things. One, don't turn your nose at it. So, what happens there, buddy? That's how people are. What does that act like? Well, you can't tell that thing at home and step forward with this thing with the bad people. No, I was just an actor. I'd be like your turn if you know that. Don't do know that. Don't be that. Number two, don't faint. Don't quit and say, well, God, don't do it. Well, no, I don't have a chance. I'm going to get it. And then quit. Those are two extremes. You can't do those things. All right, he says, think not now to the redemption of the end of the Lord, but to be chased with and stripping every son who you receive. Keep on reading. If, uh, he said, if you endure chasing, God gives you as with, as with sons. For what son is he the father chases not? For we be partakers of castles, we're all our protectors. Uh, then your children are God, if you're not partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. In fact, when you're God's child, God's your, to put it through, you God's your daddy. And God's a good daddy. And a good daddy does two, a good daddy does two things to his kids. He loves them and he works. Now, as one of these possibility thinkers and positive thinkers, and don't be judgmental, and don't be negative. Those folks are nuggets that are gone by. You think, oh, God is just loving. No, you can ruin the kids with this love. And destroy it. Yeah. It's a penitentiary. And you can overwork him and abuse him and defeat him and do his story and mess him up that way. When you got saved, you got a good father. And he's going to give you just the right amount of what you need. Now, uh, generally speaking, now this isn't in Bible, but generally speaking, folks up uh, north tend to be too rough for the kids and not loving them up, and down south they tend to love them too much and spoil them enough to take them around enough. Generally, they're exceptions, but generally that's the way it is. But the Bible says, when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. So you have to be mom and dad. What's wrong with us? They've got too much so far. I've got a little ring in their pocket. <laughs> I said, my mother and father forsaken the Lord take me up. I may sit in one place as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as a, a mother comforts her children, so will I comfort you. Another place he says, like the father pities his children, so will the Lord pity them the Which means God is a good father and a good mother, both of them. Uh, mother and father are not all. Right. I hate to point it out, sure. They're not the same. You think men are like women, you're ready for a nut out. You just <laughs> <laughs> They're not. 
I've had, I've had uh, 10 children, 14 grandchildren, so they've all come up from two or three or four or five years old, and boys are not like girls. I'm just trying to help you out, Sue. I'm going to go off the television so you lost your brain back there someplace. But they're not the same. Did you ever see a little boy, you know, getting uh, a little boy or a little girl getting called out the table of a mama for not doing something or doing something wrong? A little girl, you know, who glare her, you know, and the slap on she just cry like the marsh break. And the little boy said, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I knew that not the same. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you ladies, you're trying to be a big shot and run things. You show a lack of intelligence. Uh, God puts you in a position where you can let the man make the decisions. If you let him be head of the house, and every time as he goes wrong, it's his fault. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, that's what it's going to happen. God comes to you a break. <laughs> and the way that thing works is a woman, among other things, there's so many differences. But the main difference between a man and a woman is real simple. It's when a woman gets under real pressure, she has a terrible time making the suit. The last person I'd want you to box over me and come out would be a woman. <laughs> That'd be the last thing. They can't let me get pressure. I, I had this, this horrible vision of some big underground James Bond, stainless steel kind of room right here, 51 thing going on with all the aliens and all that kind of junk. And about that time, there's some woman there. <laughs> yeah, on a computer, a bunch of push button boards and screens and stuff. And a colonel comes down there, he comes up behind her, packs in the back, and says, You're looking lovely this morning, honey. And she goes, Hello, the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. You know, uh, I'll be sure you think I'm just getting with you. Uh, you know, uh, you know what a man will do when he wants to stop someplace to get a bar of soap? He stopped the car, gets up, goes to get the bar of soap, and then back out. If there's no big line there, it won't take you five minutes. My wife goes in. And she goes there and she comes to the soap counter, and I'm like, oh, I see we got a new brand over here. But I want that to put it small. Well, this one here is three for five. Oh, that's not a soap out there. It's about a half an hour, you know what I mean? to keep you wiping it all day long. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's something that happens to me three times a year. I'm not talking about accidents. Three times a year, this is that conservative estimate. It might be close to five. But three times a year for 50 years, that's a good number of times, see? For 150 times, I've been going through some more air force somebody the next piece of luggage trying to carry and run on uh, number 440 in two seconds. Uh, and God, you're like a broken deal running on to those people before the gate closes, and I bump them along. And I'll stand and go this way and she goes that way. I go this way and she goes that way. I go this way and she goes that way. And then she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And I go the other side. And you know something? When you run to a man you want to cross it, until you stop like this and to the left line. Because it hasn't just that much. And both of you put the weight in one foot. So if the guy goes uh, this way, you see, then you go this way. If he goes that way, then you slip over the this way. You go like that. I like the thing with the ladies. Now they dip. You ever see a, you ever see a woman kind of get a little more, uh, especially a divorced woman. Some woman about 25 years old trying to raise a kid, you know, about eight. And I put that down here. You put that down here. Jimmy, how many times mom told you to put that down? Jimmy, mom doesn't like that. Get it off. So you don't have to do She's the man there. Yes, sir. That's right. And I'm out trying to get her stuff. Put it. One more time. Oh, Jimmy, it's straight out. I remember trying to walk my daughter to the mic to dig it for her. Well, I got a couple of them bigger than I got one, six five and six seven. I come about six three. Well, he's having trouble down there at school, and uh, they get 
teach where I stood. Does anybody try to clock those children down? And he said, well, they're rather unruly. I said, well, don't you want to clock? <laughs> and he turned up and he said, children? <laughs> <laughs> All those rebels look around and glare at him, you know. He said, please be quiet. Think you know how much good that did. <laughs> I mean, in less than three seconds, we're right back. I said, you want them kids to get He said, well, I wish somebody would do something. <laughs> Mama, mama, 
mind with her, Mama, won't you? Three months later, he got up and said, I say, and I'm 
me down the front row, got up and turned around and said, I said, well, what can't you hear? He said, well, I can't hear. He said, well, thank God, I'll sit down.
there who just plant the seed faith and they become a millionaire. Here's so and so and they get it for us. Here's so and so and they get it for us. You may help them wealthy and wise, you know, and you won't be sick and you have faith to be healed and all this stuff. And God will do this and do this, you know, give to him, meaning give to the healer. That's the new prosperity gospel. You make an investment like a stock market. That is the gospel. The gospel is Christ died negative, for our sins negative, was buried negative, rose from the dead. For a man wants to follow me, they deny himself negative, and take up his cross negative upon me. Uh, I, I've said this many times, but in America, this is the wrong thing. Didn't Paul say, Do you follow me as I'm a follower of Christ? I think he did. So didn't Paul say, Walk like I walk, and others like I walk as an example? Paul let the man decide that me, Jesus Christ, might first show forth a pattern of long suffering to them that should come hereafter. Paul said, My life is a pattern for a Christian to follow. It is. No wife. No house, no church, no school, no insurance, no great block. You call that success? See, the fact that hung up on this thing, you see, but the success is plenty of money and plenty in you and plenty of good health. Not in the battle. All the sick, all the work. Try to position you. Who do you think, who do you think rules for that? It went. Luke said, we went to Troas, we went to Pat, we went, we went, he was with Paul. Why is he with Paul? Because it's a physician. Paul said, a lot of it. You get more out of it. You know, he suddenly dies and Jacob gets his head cut off. He says, only Luke is with me. A doctor. You call that success? See, Mark, you got it all, you got it all twisted up. What they've done is, there's a uh, movie, you know, Johnny Mercer wrote the musical score four years ago about Burr Rabbits, you know, and Burr Bear and Burr This and Uncle Remus. And the song that goes, if they do die, if they day, and one song is, uh, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. <laughs> well, then you're calling them wrong. <laughs> You've got to have negative to do that. And this stuff is negative. He wants to be partaker of his sufferings. I mean, my flesh rebels. You say, what? Because my flesh is like yours. Yeah. You think I look forward to getting naked with a piece of wood and naked man and folks make fun of me and die in that way? You should go to bed. Christ said, if you want to follow me, take the cross. And I just want to follow me. If you want the power of God on you, you're going to have to hurt. You're going to have to suffer. I've seen it. I've seen it. I used to watch these old guys preach, but no, they're all gone now. The old time the preachers that preached, uh, that really had the power behind them, all born in the 19th century. They weren't born in the 20th century. They're born in 1880, 1885, 1890. And they're all dead now. They're all gone. That'll be Dr. Baham, Caesar. That'll be Theodore F. That'll be Bob Young, Caesar. That'll be uh, B.R. Layton. That'll be J. Frank Morris. The book. I got thinking about that one time. I, I said kind of to myself, the Lord, I said, what, 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 what is it about those 19th century guys? What are they? They got some computer something other. These young guys don't have. A lot of young guys are good preachers. Mays Jackson's a good preacher. Olive Green's a good preacher. Les Rolls a good preacher. But those guys going back in there, they just, I don't know what they about. I got to hear several of them before I got it. And I was kind of mulling that cover with my mind, and the Lord said to me, well, Pete, how do you train for the soul? I said, you persecuted. I said, you train for the soul. You know what you do? You make a lot of hell for him, don't you do that? You know why? So it gets like, what the hell are you going to walk in? That's why. They're going to have both cars and say, stress, stress car. <laughs> I'm in <laughs> stress. <laughs> well, blow your brains out and give us a break, okay? <laughs> I mean, that's, you see it, that, that, that's the fusel that face the negative. I take those guys to a, uh, to a, a course, hospital course. They don't call it that way anymore. That's negative. What do they call it? Well, some of you know, it's some kind of a challenge or something. Got, they change it. It's not an hospital course anymore. They got to make it sound good. I've had them, I've had them just, you know, just sit down and put it through any further. And they said, I can't go, I can't go, I can't go, I can't 
I can't walk. I said, okay, crawl. And I crawled, fall flat on his face. I said, roll. What the? I mean, he said, that's me. The conditions you train men under are never as bad as real infantry combat's going to be when it comes. So however rough you get with them, the better you're preparing them, and the more uh, generous you show them, the worse favor you're doing for them, you get them shot. Uh, I, got a, I got a friend of mine out at Christ that's named Stuart. Marine, got it, I mean, three up and two down. Um, Lejeune and uh, the other base up there, Paris Island. And he got saved over in Hawaii. I mean, uh, uh, and when he got saved, the next day he came out the drill field and called it to him up and said, Now, the first thing I want to tell you, gentlemen, is I trust in Christ my Savior, and you should too. <laughs> oh, man, I think it's been a boss boy. His captain called him called him and read him out. And he stood there, yes sir, no sir, yes sir, no sir. The captain said, you can't, you, who do you think you are? Where do you get your orders from? He said, Captain, you get your orders from Washington to see I get my orders from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you lost your mind and sent him to the shrink. And the shrink worked with him, got nowhere, and he came back out and the captain said, now you're going to get caught by you're going to behave yourself. I forbid you ever again to say the name of Jesus Christ on a drill field. And Stewart said, I'll make a deal with you, Captain. I won't say it as nobody else said. Shut that stuff up, bro. I used to train those Marines, but they're such a mean <laughs> In the summertime, the temperature about 115 in Augusta, Georgia, and Paris Island, and Carolina, and those places. And I thought I had my big out there just, you know, losing five pounds a day, double time everywhere. When they come in while they're going, he go in the barracks and dump them in the foot lockers and tear up their beds and throw the uniform to the floor and then shut the windows and turn the CV up to about 140. That's <laughs> come back to that open door, they just go, they 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 go, who did this? Who did this? And he stepped down and said, the bad fairy. <laughs> <laughs> Kicked off one boot and kicked off the other boot. Didn't pray. The 
fellow that said, I'm going to pray for a minute. I'm going to pray for a minute. I would pray for a minute. And a couple minutes passed by, I didn't pray. At about 8 o'clock, the old man turned down the gas line there and lay down on the bed. And he didn't pray. And the fellow that said, You have to pray. You have to pray for it. It was dead. And about 30 minutes later, he heard Father Max say, Good night, Jesus. You can pray all the time. It's not out loud. And for that fellow that bit, about two in the morning, he liked to come out of his street. But about two o'clock in the morning, that old man got up, got up, and I was so bad in his arms, he couldn't sleep. And he'd get up there and walk up, run back to the like had a hold of those operatic arms, and he'd say, Oh my God, how much better this is than sin. Oh my God, how much better is. I'll shake up your day. That's a spirit filled man. But that's not like these modern charismatics. On the other Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 3. I'll show you the next one. And this is probably the most disobeyed commandment in the entire Bible for a modern American Christian. And this is Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. You have this case here. And this case here is Paul talking about the Christian being dead. And it's like the human God in Christ. And when Paul says the passage, he says, look down there, set your affections. That's what you love. Set your, the new Bible says, set your minds. Uh, their loves are unbelievable. They're talking about you actually. So I think about what you love. He said, set your affections. That's what you love. On things above and not on things on this earth. That's the most disobeyed command in the entire Bible for American Christians. Their affections are down here, not up there. Give your wife down here. Give your chalk your children down here. You got any affections set up there at all? Some of your brothers, if I gave you a sheet of paper right now and asked you to write me down the number of things your affections are set up there, you'd have to open your Bible and look at it to find what they will be. <laughs> your affections are on there, down here. We preach with God about that. Sometimes us preachers make the habit of making a, a God of our ministry. Lord, we think the most important thing in the world is our ministry. Our, our ministry is down here. I know it's connected with up there, but it's not up there, it's down here. That book says, set your affections on things above and not on things of earth. Thank God for the ministry. I thank God for preachers' faith in the ministry, but your clamor should be sin. And the things that are seen are temporary. Yeah. And the things that are not seen are eternal. Mm -hmm. Think about your congregation is important to their souls. I think the bodies, they're going to go to the tariffs. See that thing? that thing? Did you name right now the things in the heaven that are in your effectiveness? Christ said, lay a good treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, they will be honored. They also pay your effectiveness. I've seen that thing. I was at home one time dealing with a fellow down there in the past, and uh, thanks to all his name was Hooten. And Hooten and his wife had just gone through a terrible thing and had a little boy killed, about 10 years old, and he died a terrible death. He lived to death, called the fifth fence. And I wasn't talking about the soul, and the woman said she was a fisherman, she left crying for arms, and she couldn't go on talk. And I just talked to the man, and he wasn't saved. At least he said he wasn't saved. He said he wasn't saved. And the boy said he wasn't saved, and uh, I talked with him and talked with him and talked with him about it, and uh, he got mad. I'm a age. I'm going to bring his job, and he's got a little tanger old boy out like that. He's some kind of boy. Why did he kill me? He said, take a half of the tanger. He's better than a man. He went a good while, and I gave him a good bit of scripture. I don't know what scripture he needed. But he just got madder and madder and madder. And I got madder after a while, and talking about God like he's talking about it. Finally, I kind of lost my crew, and I said, well, maybe God didn't tell you until you get the heart in the right place. What do you mean about it? I said, maybe God did that to you until your heart never been in the right place. And you're not going to see that little boy again unless you get saved. Maybe you took him up there so you get your heart right to see him again. And I thought this book down, you're going to cry. He got saved, he was about 15 years old. He just been saved today, he just get attention. That's what they do sometimes. I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm just mad at God. He was saved. He was saved. He told me. I'm just, I'm just mad at God, preacher. I got saved my last 50 years. Fall under that. Before we got out of that man and woman are down their knees there. They're down their knees praying together and thanking God for what happened. And 
I mean, they got a lot of knowledge. But I think the book, not a book. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Very well, Mr. Nava, he had already preached not in the great preacher. And he preached uh, great, you know, on the second coming of Christ. He was up over 90 now somewhere. So it kind of gone along. I don't know the Lord and take the book. And uh, I've heard him preach many, many times. And every other sermon he preaches is on some golden morning. He always preaches on the, the second coming of Christ. You know why it is? He got a little early on Syria. I mean, with George, I think he ain't captive. That ain't you can't draw it out in San Francisco. That's what he's doing. Can't draw it. Other drug got killed, and he wants he wants to see it. So it's on his mind. Years ago, I got saved. You know, it was back in 1949. I went to Bob Jones University. Like I told you, I went there because of the flea place. And I wasn't disappointed. It was different out there, flea place. Thank God for that. And I got there, and the first Sunday, a chapel came, and I came to chapel and sat down. And here was this old choir of God. And then some guy got up in his car on my horse. And I sat there and I said, my God, man, I just left this. <laughs> I get back this mess again. And I made up my mind I wasn't going there again on Sunday. And every Sunday came, I leave campus to go up in the backwoods of Carolina and try to find me a church to go if I wasn't preaching. After a while, they'd let me in the preach for a while, but most of the time I'd just go to a church back in the backwoods someplace, try to find a place. And I was driving on down near Cullen, South Carolina. I went by a Baptist church and I could hear that thing from the highway. <laughs> boom! In the floor. And they were shouting in there, boy, and running the bases and swinging off the chandeliers and God knows what happened. And I came up there in the park and got out one in that place. An old building was locked. I mean, three or four fair owners with a hundred men and all three at the same time. I started to stay away in a big old tall one gallon of redneck farm, that's a that's a suspect. And, and this big old redneck coming down here about six feet three, an old farmer, and he didn't know me from Adam. And when he saw me in that land, he picked me up and grabbed me, picked me up and hugged me and said, Go to God, brother, and threw me down and on down the stairs. <laughs> I said, This is the place. <laughs> I said, God, why do you do this to me? And 
I'm not here preaching the word. And I should take her in my family and watch her on and on and on and on and take another girl. And I'm not going to preach those people. I've been telling them to get tired. And God might, you know, take one of the shows. I can't face them. I can't face them. I'm not going yet. You quit. I don't know what she was like that. And about that time, the knock the door and I looked up and he said, Come in. A little king man, his name is uh, Harv Sandberg. Now, Harv Sandberg, I wish I could have met the fellow, but at this time, this happened, he was around 90. He was one of those uh, 19th century preachers. Those mountain preachers from North Carolina. I see this church up there named Valley up in the mountains. And he don't know it. But uh, I could tell a, I could tell a, a, South, a North Carolina preacher in the church. I've heard my mother about North Carolina. You know why? Because every guy that got to call a preach up there in Carolina followed or patted himself after our Sandberg. Those guys were like Ed Below and Homer Smith and uh, Phil Keeter and uh, Sammy Allen and B.D. Uh, Caldwell and Harold Seiker and Carl Ackett. And Oliver Green and May Jackson. I could tell them anywhere on earth. They covered that guy's nice style. And that guy, he was some character, that brother. And he came in there and uh, said, Morning, Harold. And he said, Morning, Harold, huh? what to do for you? Boys came out to see you. What you want to see me about? Nothing. Well, come on, so you can drive down here 80 miles from Charlotte just to look at me. He said, Yeah, it. So I've seen you now, so long. I started out the door. And, uh, and Harold said, What'd you come down here for? So I came out and looked at you. You can come must have down here, come down here for more than that. I said, No, no, I did So I just down here 80 miles by my house and looked at one preacher that God wasn't afraid to turn the devil loose on. And there I got it. Wiped his eyes, smiled off his face, and got his Bible, came to church. We got to church, he preached one morning at church on some things on money. I, I, I just about preached the birthday of money and going back and checking on it. I remember his first point was, I'm learning, but I've been looking too hard in some folks. I'm going to try to be looking more in my days. He said, number two, he said, I'm learning something else. He said, I'm learning that a fellow never knows how many friends he has to a time like this. And he said, point number three, I'm learning that all things work together for good and love of God, who would call it for these things. I mean, he shook that congregation like a hurricane, he shook the leaves in the wind for it. I was dry on that place. I've heard, I've had a sight of many times since then. I mean, 40, 50 times since then. And every other Sunday preachers is on the rapture. Every other Sunday. You say, why? Well, got an affection on that place. That's why. Wants to see those early days. Harold was one of those fellows who never learned how to preach properly, or use his voice properly. He liked to ruin his voice before he finally learned how to preach the diaphragm when he preached when he preached. Uh, Jesse Henley never did learn. He had to use a microphone the last ten years of his life, but his voice was gone. I'm the microphone out of here. It, it, it messed up the vocal cords, they don't breathe well. But Harold got his straight mountain time, so it didn't ruin his voice, but it still has a huskiness to it. It shows how the pivot had gone on the way he'd been going. And uh, it's sort of quite, quite interesting. Oh, great experience for you. Oh, let's go. You know, you did the Ivory Baptist meeting with the Holy Ghost. What's that? The Holy Ghost. I didn't preach up at uh, Gastonia, North Carolina, one night. Had about 200 Southern Baptists in there. He's waxing out of it, you know. He was saying, uh, man, I should go and come by and get some of that handfuls of purpose to the roof out there in the field. And don't you worry about old Harold Sider about getting the longer head and nothing. Every time I get down the mountain, the Lord comes by and just gives me a few handfuls of purpose. But God, I don't feel like preaching tonight. I feel like shouting, I think I will. And they jump up my foot and go, Wow! You got to do for five blocks, man. You get that invitation, he says, uh, You bunch of bit GI, get a practice in your RAs, your GI, your son, you ain't running out here like you own the world. Why, you ought to be so thankful that God for your salvation. You ought to be crawling out of this pulpit right now on your hands and knees, saying the amazing grace. I'll sweep the sound and stay direct like me. I've seen 400 people come down and just drop on that floor and crawl and sing the amazing grace. I'll sweep the sound and stay direct like me. That's the story. I heard how I get up one night and he said, uh, Tomorrow night, bless God, I'm going to preach out of the greatest chapter in the Bible, that chapter of all the chapters. Myself. Said, What's that? Sir? Serve in the Mount or like farewell to the Ephesians or the elders of Ephesus or uh, what is it? And he says, Yes, sir, that great 
text, 16, 17, 18, just read a little. You know why it's read a little? Because they're making four and five thousand an hour, and they're cockroaching all over the place, and some of their wives are sick and they can't pay the bill, and their heart's in the right place. And you're a lady. God may have to do that to you. I hope he does. See? It may, to make you, to make you heavenly in mind. That's right. To make you heavenly in mind, God may have to put you through that. I hope he does. But if a good Christian that loves God, believes the book, goes to church, prays, tithes, reads his Bible, and sometimes takes his children, he'll do it. He'll do it. And not because of sin. Not because of some terrible back <coughs> condition. The heart is in the right place. All right, now we'll get to the end here. We'll take one more down here, and this thing here will be a uh, this will be one that's a good Christian supper to show him that the promises of God say what they mean to him what they say. Heavenly promises. Now we also we read the promises of the Bible. We'll take, for example, Philippians, and we'll take uh, Philippians chapter uh, uh, four and thirteen and nineteen. Those are two of the greatest promises in the Bible. And the Lord asks you, do you believe the promise of God? And you can say, yes. You believe God is a faithful and God's not a liar? Yes. You don't think God is a liar? No. You don't believe God promised something not here? No. You believe God do that, I'm sure. And I would say that too. But of course, come to show it. Uh, sometimes I wonder, do I really believe it? Don't I? I mean, you never know. I thought the Bible didn't want to do it for my profession. It's more real than my skin is. And yet sometimes I said to myself, you need to go book? I'll give you a good one. I can do all things through Christ with strength with me. That's a promise, amen? How many believe that promise in you man? I don't know really what you read. I said, you can do anything, do anything you should do through Christ. If you could read the Bible through Christ a year, a year you can do it. If you should give tithes and offerings above the tithe, you can do it. God probably have not done it. Give me the promises. See, we say we believe. And you get right down to it and you say, well, do I or don't I? Come on now. I can do all things through Christ. I can put a bad act through Christ to strengthen me. Amen. How come you have to do it? See, that's how we are. Oh, Adamic nature, so there. I'll give you a My God shall follow your knee to his rich and glory, but not his ears. I didn't say it's a part of your greed. It's a part of your knee. Children are quick to catch all that. You know how smart kids are. Huh? When your kids are about two or three, Daddy, uh, we want some ice cream. Daddy, I want some ice cream. Six years old, Daddy, we need some ice cream. <laughs> You see how that original got changed there in translation and all? The kid got you figured out. And he knows that if you think he needs something, he'll get it. And he also knows just because he wants something, doesn't mean he's always going to get it. So he switches. Crash into the brakes of mine. I know you're right. Figure a way around that. I'm going to ice cream, but I'm ice cream, don't you? I need mean, ice cream. <laughs> and you gotta get it. <laughs> All my old grandsons, and you know, everybody, everybody loves the grandchildren. That's why they call them grandchildren, because they're grandchildren. And you take his name, Gus. Gus the character now. He's turned out real well. He's not real fine. Police and star football play, all this stuff. Safe man. King James witnesses. He's about six feet three and about, uh, oh, about 280. And then the little brown eyes is like buttons, it's like chocolate. And clock side bomb. Stranger can track to us in your life. The little old boy, about, oh, about three or four years old, he led him out to the church for a minute. My two girls were in the front of the back. She's running, running this with Rachel. Rachel at the time was about 10. And Gus was about three or four. And Gus was crying about something. And I'm trying to keep my mind on the steering wheel, you know, just the room in the back seat. I'm on the cracker, I'm on the cracker, I'm on the cracker, I'm on the cracker. And, and, and Rachel kind of calmed him down. She could do better than his mother. And Rachel's like, listen, well, I'll get you back. 
down on the ground. And stuff went on for about 10 minutes. So I said, shut up, I'm going to bite you. <laughs> and, 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 and Rachel, who ran away, was serious. She, well, I, I was raising those boys. They were 14, 15, 16. They were like, you know, I one son. I didn't come on my side. So I said, get to lose And Rachel knew how to do it. <laughs> and, and, and Gus, I went to crack and I saw, I saw the ruby and I saw Rachel. <laughs> and then I said, one more time, I'm going to smack somebody. And then Gus brought it up. And I watched him review the mirror. And he looked against the bike seat like this. And he goes, And he bent right over, and I hear, It's a racial. And I want to start on that. Oh, well, I mean, what you can't take. That's not 
scripture. But it's scriptural. God is, I'll give you grace sufficient for what you go through. And that's not all those strange verses. Now, I say I believe that. But I see that. I guess the fact that I testify I'm not sure that I really believe it. It hasn't happened to me, but I've seen it happen to others. And I see this and go through things, but honest with God, I don't see how they ever got to it. I really don't. I'm, I'm surprised all of them commit suicide. He attempted to follow us. He said, I'm a strength that takes two, desiring to have to part be with Christ, which is far better. He said, for me to leave this Christ to die of gain. I thought I was trying to get killed all the life. No, but this you read second Corinthians eleven. Nobody trying to be careful to get in that much trouble. <laughs> but read that thing in the letter. Shipwrecks, you know, a deep with rods, you know, or a day and night in the deep, all that kind of stuff. He wasn't trying to be careful. I know he wasn't trying to be careful because I read in my Bible there when he was over there uh, preaching over there in Asia Minor. He went one down there and they took him out and, and beat him. And they left him out there. He's out there around how many thought he was dead. And uh, about that time he came to, and the Bible said he rose up and went back into the city. <laughs> What's a dumb thing to do? And this way you got your brain locked out. <laughs> now, what did you do that for? Well, I know what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that uh, he, I knew a man about 14 years ago, but in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell God knows. That's where you read it. Second Corinthians 12, 1 to 4. I knew a man in Christ about uh, 14 years ago, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. Such an one was caught up in the third heaven, and the heard words which is not lawful for man's daughter. Of such a one I will glory, but of myself I will glory. Now, why do you say that? He say, I don't know if it's in the body, out of the body. Well, his soul was caught up. That's what's going on. His soul was caught up there, and he, he sat there looking around and seeing this stuff. He said, Boy, it's not something, man. I've never seen that place. But if I ever got up there and saw it, 
and had to come back down here. I'd be passing out tracks there in the middle of the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. 
I'll just be surprised he hasn't done any of it. What's holding him up? My grace is sufficient for in this way. I don't see how. I know it's so. Here's one of the stuff you got a great, uh, you got a great uh, preacher. I mean, he was not my style, you know. He was a charismatic. And he didn't go for the tongue, but he went for the healing. His name was Uncle Bud Robinson. They called him Uncle Buddy. And Bud Robinson found the Nazarene sect, that sect. And, uh, but he lived off people Christ, sweet soul, dear soul, very, very, uh, very blessed God, huge God. And when Bud Robinson got there, I think it's about 54 or something, he was uh, up in New York. And Bud Robinson was out in Texas. He'd never seen a building higher in a bank building. It'd be about 20 stories higher. And he got to New York, went around Times Square, and he looked at the cry of the building. <laughs> and when he got there, he got the Empire State Building. And went back to his hotel room, and his tonsil was sunburned from looking up in the air. <laughs> and he got out and he be by his bed and said, You know, I just want to thank you. I didn't see nothing the way I wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and while he was there, he went across the traffic, and some drunk came tearing through traffic at about four or five miles down here and knocked him up uh, eight feet in the air and ten feet out in front of the car and ran over the hand for it on the brakes. And old blood was lying in the pool of the blood of the ankle broken, the roots crushed, and one arm. Uh, but the the broken block stuck through stuck in his shirt. And the other arm broke. He was lying down the ground that pool of blood, but facing him saw it, was chasing that car, a boy the first one cursing the driver. And he went by Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud said, Now don't talk that way, I don't like your folks talk that way. <laughs> but had an impediment in speech. But my buddy used to say, Don't say I said something I didn't say. <laughs> they said, Uncle Bud, when you were the boy, was you poor? He said, well, we poor, we were so poor, we only ate one meal a day. They said, we threw the other two. He said, well, he said, for breakfast, we ate food, and for dinner, we drank water, and for supper, we let them well. And they took him up there in the hospital, there, Captain Hospital. They got him in there, and they got him there, and the young man had to cut his clothes off him before I can cross out all the way. One of them said, uh, what kind of, what kind of occupation do you you in, my old man. You're too old, about 54. And he said, well, I'm a preacher. They said, you need all the patience. You can preach now before you get out of here. They put him in the, what they call the dining room. Back in those days, there wasn't, wasn't a lot of drugs like they have now. And they leave him in, the, in, the, in this kind of a barracks so the doctor could see him in the morning. And a little, about five o'clock in the morning, the priest came through there. Extreme unction, last flash, you know. Come around his house, he's tossing it on, he's eating my own oil, like I was, and burning the candles and flipping the beads. And he went on to his place and he said, uh, uh, Son, you want me to confess? And he said, Yes, I want to confess Jesus Christ my Savior. Glory to God. <laughs> <laughs> he back and came back and said, Anything else? <laughs> and Buck said, Yes, sir, I want to say he's saved, he and sanctify him through the Holy Ghost. Glory. I don't think he shot out of like a rat in one of those and about 4 oh, 8 o'clock in the morning, around comes the doctor. And he looks up the boat over and he says, Well, old man, I go with one arm. I can be save your leg and ankle. I go with one arm. The gangrene said that he can't save it. He said he could, but he probably couldn't stand the pain. And Bud said, Well, I threw it to you. Go ahead and try. And the doctor said, Well, I don't know whether you can take it or not. And Uncle Bud said, Well, I'm a Christian. I do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And my doctor said, Well, I don't know what a Christian is. I'm an atheist myself. Or is it you need to work or try? So to make a long story short, you work on Uncle Bud, he's coming there about every other day, and one arm is hanging up there, dripping plush, you know, the other one's still in a sling, and he takes his scalpel and straight that bone with no anesthesia. You know, Bud will lie there and he pass in, pass out, and have comas. He might go on to the remember. <laughs> the first time my doctor came in there, he said, uh, he said, now, doctor, he said, I know you're not going to try to hurt me, you're kind of going to do me good. He said, I just want to tell you something. I love you. And he said, I want you to live forever in heaven with me. And the doctor said, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the word. After about a week of that doctor coming there, and Bud said, I still love you, doctor. I'll tell you what I have to live in heaven with me. He said, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. So, and after about 
about three weeks. What was that the time of the boy? Three weeks, that doctor was sweating all around his face, screaming that thing, and reached a certain point there before he knew all the stuff was out. And before he could think what he was doing, he said, Glory to God, but we got it. <laughs> <laughs> and he both left that hospital. He both left that hospital. That doctor met him at the door. And the doctor said, uh, Father, I, I, I don't want to ask you something for you, Bill. He said, What's that? He said, Do you still love me? And he said, Yeah, I still do. He said, You want to have me live forever in heaven, will you? He said, Yeah, I sure do. And he put his arm around and bugged, and he said, You know, bug. He said, when you came in, I didn't do with such a thing as a Christian. And after working on you, I got to make the rich. And he said, I'll show you like that for every heaven you. And he got to show you. And uh, <laughs> you know what Bud found out? He found out my grace is sufficient for me. I know I've got people in my congregation that know more about uh, I can do all things through Christ with strength than I'll ever know. You know, read the hymn, you can't have any verses. There's some words in that Bible, but you've got to live through them on the side. You ain't going to get a maneuver. I saw them. Now, I don't like to talk about that last time. You know why? I know about it. I know about the martyrs. I was watching the martyrs through about, some martyrs, about old 1718 times. I know what that verse is saying. I don't like what it says. A lot of the Bible, I don't care about it. I don't. You say, why? Well, my flesh just rebelled against it. I know what God was saying to me. See? But I haven't got the, the just to appreciate it. He is saying, what from all you need is me. You don't need your family. You don't need your health. You don't need your clothes. You don't need your friends. You need me. That book is saying, all you need is God. He's all sufficient. I do not know 